talk. So thank you so much for being here. My name is Susan Barber and I'm the Community Education Manager at Mission Hospice and Home Care. And I see a lot of very familiar faces here. So that's also wonderful to see you all. Um, for those that are not familiar with Mission Hospice, we are a small not-for-profit and non-affiliated, which means that we are not associated with a large hospital system or with a healthcare system. We are a independent hospice that was founded by two women in our community in 1979. And one of those women became our very first patient also in 1979. And so it also means that the people that work and uh, volunteer with Mission Hospice live in our community. And so this is really a wonderful um, experience of serving people in the community that we live in. Uh, we have had a community education program, Mission Hospice and Home Care, um, since 2015, and this year, of course, like all of you, we had to go um, on Zooming. So it's uh, just a wonderful thing to be able to have a community of people that still gather for these sorts of talks and educational opportunities. For those of you that are familiar with our program, we have a cafe monthly, uh, weekly, and then a community conversation once or twice a month, and we'll be starting our author series in January. And everybody attending will be getting an email shortly about our upcoming events. There'll also be an evaluation at the end of today's program that I will send fairly immediately, and it's incredibly helpful for you to complete those so that we have some idea what the impact of this program is on our community. Having taken care of all of those things, and yes, thank you, Rachel, is saying that uh, Mission Hospice is located in San Mateo, California, which is the county just between San Francisco and San Jose. We serve Northern Santa Clara as well, and so thank you, Rachel. Um, I also want to welcome all the folks from the Meta Institute uh, who have taken Frank's training. I know there's a number of you with us today. I had the pleasure of taking that training in 2011. And I believe that that was the last class that Frank formally taught as a year long program. Um, I'm just so grateful to Frank Ostasetsky for joining us today. Uh, the, Frank is the, an internationally respected Buddhist teacher, a visionary, co founder of the Zen Hospice Project, founder of the Meta Institute. He's going to stay awake through this introduction here. Um, He's lectured at Harvard Medical School, the Mayo Clinic, Wisdom 2.0, and most importantly at Mission Hospice. He has been a wonderful supporter of our programming at Mission Hospice for years now, and I'm just so grateful. Um, we are doing a six month deep dive uh, into Frank's book, The Five Invitations from January till June with some of our uh, community ambassadors in 2001, uh, 2021, and we are so looking forward to that. And more information will be coming on that. And with that, I'm going to turn my mic off and Frank, um, thank you so much for all you do for so many people, but especially what you've done with Mission Hospice these last five years. Okay, Susan, thank you. Very kind of you to have me. I appreciate the invitation. Um, it's nice to be with everyone. Um, due to my strokes, I don't see very well now. So sometimes you're just a, a mass of color and shapes and then occasionally my brain coalesces uh, the, the vision can coalesce and i can see you as an actual face in your little thumbnail images but um you know even though my brain's a little whacked i trust my heart to speak so i'll let that speak today and see what we can learn together there's a quote by saint john of the cross that i've always loved he says, tenderly, I now touch all things, knowing one day we will part. Tenderly, I now touch all things, knowing one day we will part. Yeah. What would it be like if we recognize that the fragility of life, the constant change of life, and allowed that to inform the way in which we meet life and meet each other and, and, and care for ourselves. So Susan said this is the last uh, session in her series and, you know, she wanted me to talk something about endings and, and, you know, this has been a hell of a year, hasn't it, 2020, you know. My son is putting out a bottle of wine that has a, uh, that says, year end 2020 with a, uh, a dumpster on fire on the label. 
so it's been a troublesome year for us, you know, climate catastrophe, racial tensions of all sorts, you know, the pandemic, sometimes even taking a back seat to those kinds of crises. But I don't so much want to talk about review the year, you know, I want to talk about endings and what they can show us, what they can teach us. You know, if you want to know something about what death has to teach, pay attention to endings. You know, the, the end of an exhale, the end of the day, the end of a meal, the end of this sentence. So, so in this time together that we have, I want to kind of point our attention to the endings of things. You know, when this Zoom is over, what's it going to be like? <laughs> you know, most of us have developed habits around the way we meet endings. I want to take some time today to explore some of those habits, yeah? You know, there's a chant that when you go into any Zendo, any meditation hall in a Zen center, there's a large wooden block called a Han. And it's wrapped on with a wooden mallet, you know, and, and uh, written across that Han in, in black sumi ink is a quote. And there's different versions of it. It usually goes something like this. Life and death are of supreme importance. Time passes swiftly and opportunity is lost. Let us awaken. Let us awaken. Do not squander this life, yeah? And what's interesting about that block, or at least to me it's interesting, is that over the years of hammering it with this wooden you know, mallet, hammering this piece of oak with this wooden mallet, what happens is that those words literally get beaten into the wood and the words disappear and the block remains. And the block itself becomes the teaching because after all that hammering over a period of years, the block itself becomes a fragile thing. And eventually the block even breaks apart. Yeah. And we're like that, you know, we're vulnerable things. Do not squander this life. You know, one of the, the central teachings of Buddhist practice, and I have no missionary zeal, by the way, about Buddhist practice, but, you know, we can, we can turn to it for some wisdom. And one of the central teachings of it are the teaching of impermanence, the, the fact that things are constantly changing. Everything is constantly changing. Now, impermanence isn't the cause of suffering. <laughs> Clinging and ignorance, they're the cause of suffering. We don't want things to change. We want them to be the way they are, you know. We want things to stay as they are. You know what's curious to me, just sitting here, we all agree that everything comes and goes, right? Seasons come and go, relationships come and go, our lives come and go, yeah? Everything is constantly changing except me. I'm the one thing that isn't constantly changing in the universe, you know? We like to think of ourselves as a solid thing moving through an ever-changing world. You know, once in a while, I, I, I meet up with somebody that I haven't seen in many years, and they very kindly say to me, oh, Frank, you, you, you look just the same. You haven't changed in 40 years. And I'm a little offended by that, honestly. I think a lot of changes happened for me in these years. I think we, we misperceive, when we misperceive, I should say, that the basic law of impermanence, we get fixated on things. We, we start clinging, we get attached in a way that's not so, so helpful, including to an idea of who we are and what we're capable of. For some of us, I think, impermanence is kind of personally frustrating, right? No matter how we try, we can't make things permanent. And acknowledging this truth doesn't make us failures or pessimists, it just aligns us with what's true. 
and that we don't have so much control over that. And, and sometimes actually when I come into contact with that, I'm really glad that I'm not the only one who can't keep it all together. You know, we try to control the uncontrollable. We, we look for security and predictability. We understandably seek, you know, comfort and safety. We like happy endings, we like Disney movies, but what we're given is constant change and uncertainty. We struggle and we howl like, you know, wolves at the moon at the big flash of our life, you know, this, this momentary flash of our life. But suppose we turn toward it and, and found in it some of the majestic beauty that's in that brevity. I mean, think about a, a really well-prepared meal and then it's consumed and enjoyed, right? Or think about the work of, of Andy Goldsworthy, the great, you know, um, eco-artist who makes these amazing, you know, artistic pieces out in nature that then are destroyed by the rains or the tides or the rivers. I was in Japan, not last year, the year before teaching and I happened to be there at the height of cherry blossom season. And it was just beautiful, hillsides covered with cherry blossoms, these little delicate, such exquisite flowers that last for only a week. Or this place where I teach up in, in Idaho, there's a cabin that I stay in. And outside that cabin, there were these little tiny blue flax flowers that last for a single day, only one day. You know, tell me, why are those cherry blossoms, why are those blue flax flowers so beautiful? And why do they, do they engage us so much more than plastic flowers do? I mean, plastic flowers last forever, right? I think there's something about their brevity and their impermanence that invites us into their, their beauty and fill us with wonder and gratitude. You know, when I'm holding the hand of someone very old who's dying, I'm thinking of this one particular woman, Rose, that I cared for. I noticed that her skin was almost transparent. And, you know, her whole being began to be that way as well, as if the wind could blow right through her. There was nothing obscuring who she actually was. She was, I, I used to say to her, you're just a wrinkle in time. <laughs> you know, some of you know this wonderful uh, artistry of the Hopi Indians, the sand painting. So the Tibetan sand mandalas that you might be even more familiar with. You know, monks mindfully, very delicately create these um, sand paintings. Uh, these mandalas, they create them over a period of days. And it's this beautiful mystical art form of, of Tibet. And um, the, the monks use these colored sand and these little tiny funneled metal tubes with deposits of sand in them. And they knock on them with a tiny little hammer and they make these incredibly intricate patterns that are just beautiful. And when the mandala is, is completed, it's not preserved, but deliberately destroyed as a meditation on impermanence. Uh, many years ago, I remember in San Francisco, there was a, um, uh, an exhibit at the Asian Art Museum and His Holiness the Dalai Lama came um, to San Francisco to, be, to, to speak at that exhibit. And as preparation for this, a group of monks got together, uh, Tibetan monks, and they came and they, they created one of these beautiful sand mandalas on the floor in the main lobby, if you will, of the Asian Art Museum. And it was just exquisite, actually. And uh, there were, of course, red velvet ropes all around this, this gorgeous uh, sand mandala. And um, Lapsam Santam, who was the, the head monk doing the uh, paintings, was talking to a crowd of people when in the midst of his talk, this woman jumped over the red ropes and came through the sand painting and started kicking it and scattering the, the, the sand all over the floor. She was a little disturbed, this woman. And uh, of course the security guards came and the museum officials, you know, 
you know, got hold of this woman and they called the police and, oh, there was a big hubbub, you know, but, but the monk, Lam Sam Samtam, you know, he, he wasn't so disturbed. He said, please, please, please don't, don't, don't harm her. It's okay, you know, we were gonna destroy it anyway. And, and we can build another one. It's okay, we could build another one. And when reporters asked them, asked him rather, what they thought of this woman who was disturbed, he said, oh, we, we don't know her. And we, we don't wanna judge her motivations. We just pray for her with love and compassion. You see, the, the truth of impermanence was really in the bones of these monks. To the museum officials, it was an irreplaceable piece of art. To, to the monks, it was just a process of teaching, the value and the beauty of which was about impermanence and change. So we want to look at endings. We want to understand them so we can un understand something about what death has to teach us. How do you meet the endings in your life? I mean, do you go unconscious around them? Do you leave either emotionally or mentally before the event or the experience that you're in the midst of is over? Maybe you're the last one in the parking lot, you know, watching as the final participants go away, waving to them. Maybe you feel sad and, and teary-eyed around endings or, or anxious. Or maybe you're indifferent to endings and you isolate yourself, withdrawing into some kind of protective cocoon, you know? In the days when we were meeting with each other at live conferences and live retreats, you know, how did you leave? Do you stop talking to people, you know, to sort of prepare yourself for the fact that the endings are arriving? When you leave work at the end of the day, how do you say goodbye to your colleagues? Those of you who are working in the hospice, how do you say goodbye to your clients? You know, do you wait for others to acknowledge the end or do you jump the gun, you know? I want to look at this. I want to see what happens, you know. Without judgment, without any criticality, let's just be curious to see how we meet endings. Just look and see. Like when a relationship ends, how do you do it? Do you go away mad? Do you try to shift the nature of the relationship and try to keep it going? What are your patterns? Is there a way that you normally end things that's satisfactory for you? Or is it something you want to change? You don't have to follow your required habit. You don't have to enact your past patterns. You have choice. Let's draw our attention to endings. Maybe we could take a minute now just to reflect, you know, let's put down whatever we're holding on to, our you know, coffee cups or our laptops or our ideas and just sit for a second. Let's just sit together and come into contact with this body. Really to sense this body. You may let your eyes close if that's more comfortable for you. And just begin to feel this body sitting here.
So just um, to bring into our awareness that impermanence is everywhere, and it looks like Frank has fallen out of our Zoom room. So he will be back with us shortly. But I'm going to share with you something that Frank was going to play a little bit later in today's presentation. Um, while he's getting his tech back together, I'm just going to screen share this. I'm going to ask Rai, one of our volunteers, to just continue to let people in the room as they arrive. And let's see here. Here in downtown Manhattan, Federal Hall, the Grand Rotunda, a great sounding room for trumpet. Jazz music is the perfect metaphor for democracy. We improvise, which is our individual rights and freedoms. We swing, which means we are responsible to nurture the common good of everyone in fine balance. And we play the blues, which means no matter how bad things get, we remain optimistic while still mindful of problems. I like to always think about the founders and all the geniuses and men of accomplishment Think about them in terms of the first beboppers like Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie, Thelonious Monk. They were working out fundamentals of an idea of a way to play that featured very, very quick thinking, adjustment, and the ability to have a light framework and fill it with things of genius that also can be amended in the same way that we work under the, the Constitution. Let's not forget that the federal Constitution has many, many fewer words than any state Constitution. So they framed a very flexible and strong document that still serves us well if we choose to follow it. The one thing you learn as a jazz musician is how to listen. We don't know what people are gonna play, so it's very important for us to follow them and follow very, very closely. We have a saying, if you wanna find something new to play, listen to the person next to you. The question that confronts us right now as a nation is do we wanna find a better way? And if we answer affirmative, We'll make it through these things. If we decide no, we want to be our worst selves, we're gonna struggle. I think Amazing Grace is a, a, a song that is our unofficial national anthem. It's our folk anthem. John Newton wrote it, and, and he's uh, not American, but the, but the roots of American music are Anglo-Celtic, and it's about transformation. He was a, he was a slave trader and his ship ran into some very terrible weather. And you know, when things go really, really bad, you tend to reach for the creator or reach for something uh, that's much greater than your situation. And he said, if I come out of this, I will be transformed. I'm gonna change my life. He went from being a slave trader to an abolitionist. And this song comes out of his reawakening. Everybody sings it, everybody plays it. It's so deeply soulful. I can't remember a time that I did not know this song.
And so um, we are going to have Frank back in the room and just right now. And I just uh, thank you all for taking a minute to listen to that. And um, Frank, I'm going to have him unmute uh -huh. and we join us as the co-host. Frank, we just listened to the video that you had oh. talked about sharing and we've just, it was perfect timing. Um, it just ended. And so welcome back. Thank you. I, I apologize for going away on you. I, uh, the power went off in where I live. And so it just, it went off very shortly and came back on. <laughs> so how did you feel about that ending? Well, as somebody posted, impermanence is everywhere. Yeah. Okay, let's come back. Welcome back. Let's come back to where we were and start again, okay? Uh, one of my teachers, Suzuki Roshi, used to, his favorite meditate, my favorite meditation of his was begin again, begin again. So let's come back into this body of ours, sensing the body. You know, however we are sitting here. Feeling the whole body from head to toe. Feeling the large, gross sensations. Feeling of your body against the chair or your feet on the floor. The sense of the fabric of your clothing against your skin. Or the cool air on your hands and face. And quite naturally, without any, hardly any effort at all, you become aware of your breath. Not the thought of your breath, but the direct experience. Becoming aware of the inhale, the very beginning, middle and end of the inhale. And the very beginning, middle and end of the exhale. You might notice that there's a place where you feel it more easily, more vividly. Maybe it's as the air dances there at the tip of the nose. Or maybe you feel the ribs lifting and separating as the chest fills. Or some of us feel it more at the diaphragm, the way it expands and contracts when the belly empties and fills. Or still others might just feel the breath in the whole body, the whole body breathing, which it is. I'd like to draw your attention just a little bit to this pause, this gap at the end of the exhale. See if you can sense the space there. See what happens for you. Is there any activity in that space? Are you aware of any kind of feeling tone, anxiety or striving, maybe relaxation? Is there some grasping for the next breath? or some distraction. Be aware of the attitude of mind that's there. The lens or the relationship you're having with this gap. What's happening in the mind? Is it planning or strategizing? Are there repetitive thoughts? 
restless thoughts. Do you trust the next breath will come on its own? Can you rest in the gap? Let me just pause. Really see if you can get a sense of what happens at the very end of the exhale. At the very end of the inhale. I'm going to ring a small bell here a few times, three times. And see if you can just notice the very beginning of the sound, the middle of the sound, and the end of the sound. Beautiful, thank you. It's a good way to come back after we were so rudely interrupted. <laughs> so a few thoughts about endings that come to mind. You know, clinging to the old makes it very difficult for the new to emerge. Or at least it limits our capacity to welcome the new. And our clinging, it has so many dimensions and characteristics, right? When we, we cling to the old because sometimes we're still demanding that the past be different or other than it is. Maybe we feel unfinished or we want bigger successes or we want more love. Sometimes we don't want to face the difficulty of change, the uncertainty, the, the unknown the risk of meeting the new and the unfamiliar. When we let loose of the old, we enter into don't know mind, you know, a mind that's a don't know mind isn't a mind of ignorance. It's a mind that isn't so full of our knowing. It's more full of wonder and curiosity. What happens when we, when we just let things go? So I don't want to talk on for a long time. I actually want to talk to you and, and have you talk to each other. And so I have a, a simple mm, exercise I'd like us to do, but you know, I want you to think about, oh, for example, when you go to a party, you know, or when you go to a gathering, maybe you come to a, a conference of some kind, how do you leave? What do you do? What are our habits around that? 
like my friend Rachel Redman and I, who teach together a lot, she was telling me about a, how she was at a party with her friend Michael. And, you know, she motioned to Michael that it was time to go. And Michael said, okay, all right, let's go then. And Rachel headed for the door. And Michael, of course, headed back into the room to say goodbye to every single person. He went up to every person and said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't get a chance to talk to you. Maybe next time we'll have an opportunity to speak. And the next person, oh, I was so glad to see you. I was happy to see you again. And let's try and stay in touch, you know. Or, you know, he greeted each person and consciously said goodbye to each one. Rachel was already out the door and on the sidewalk, you know. You know, when I was guiding the Zen Hospice Project, I said goodbye to every patient every night. You know, and I would say, I don't know if I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> so I want to make sure I say goodbye tonight, you know. So what's it like when you leave a party or you leave a gathering? What do you do? How do you normally meet those endings? So if you've got a pencil or you have a computer in front of you, probably you could just type, type these three questions. And, and Susan will also put them in the chat in case you don't have something to write with. But I have three questions for you. The first one is, how do you normally meet endings? What's your pattern? What's your way? No judgment, just let's see. Second question, why do you think or feel that you meet endings in that way? Yeah. And the third question is, where did you learn to meet endings in that way? How did you learn that? Did someone teach it to you? Was it a family tradition? Was it a cultural tradition? Did you just watch others? How did you learn to meet endings in that way? So how do you normally meet endings? Why do you think or feel you meet them in that way? And how did you learn to meet endings in that way? Okay, that's, those are the three questions, are sort of inquiry questions. Now, you don't have to have all the answers to these. This is a process of open-ended inquiry, open-ended discovery, yeah? In fact, it's more interesting to see what you can learn through this inquiry now than sort of giving your laundry list of answers that you already know. Let's see if we can discover together. So what we're gonna do in just a moment, Susan, through the magic of Zoom, we'll put you into individual rooms, breakout rooms, where you'll be in a room with probably three people. We hope that'll work. and. What we're going to do is just provide some time there, maybe 15 minutes or so. So each person has about five minutes to speak. And just try and give your responses to these questions. How do you normally meet endings? Like, oh, I'm the first one out the door, or I'm the last one to leave the room, or I hate endings, you know? And how do you, why do you think you meet endings in that way? And who, where did you learn it? Where did you learn to meet endings in that way? Each person will speak, you know, for a few minutes. You know, we'll, we'll give them a chance to speak without interrupting them. We'll just listen, you know, as they sort of do a monologue on that. And then, you know, we'll come back to a large group, see what we discovered together. Okay, that's, that's pretty easy. I think we can all manage that. Um, Susan, is there anything, instructions you need to give them about these breakout rooms? Yeah, Frank, so... Um... The Zoom is letting me break it down to four people in a room. So it will be four people okay. in each room. And right, we'll also 20 minutes then, okay? Okay. And uh, uh, just to make it clear, the breakout rooms are not recorded. There's nothing that's going to be recorded there. And I will do my best to send those questions into the room as well while you're in the room together. So I think that's all. So Frank, before, you, before you put them in the group, Susan, you know, so this is, this is what I want to encourage, actually. I want to encourage you to just listen to each other, to listen devoutly to each other. That means to listen generously, because when we listen in that way, when we fully, when we really listen to someone in a devout way, it helps to draw the truth out from them. They feel heard and they're not judged about their answers because probably they're already, you know, assessing whether their answers are good or not, you know? So listen in a generous way to each other and, uh, don't interrupt each other. Let the, let the person who's speaking have the floor, so to speak. Okay. All right. So Susan, let's do that, and we'll and then uh, we'll bring them back in fifteen to twenty minutes. Hi everyone. I think you're coming back. Susan, you're muted. Hi. 
Yes, welcome back everybody. And I think the breakout rooms, Frank, are still some people coming back. Okay, good. Probably about another minute. Okay. Yep, they're still coming in. Looks like we're good though, Frank. It looks like we can. Okay, all right, good. Hi everyone, welcome back. Nice to see you again. Um, so I'm curious actually, I'm really curious uh, to hear from you and see what you discovered in these little breakouts and these discussions. Uh, I, I really wanna talk to you. So to do that, there's a methodology to do that. And, and the way you do it is you raise your hand, not your physical hand, but you go down to the participants icon at the bottom of your screen. And if you click on that, you should see a button that says raise hand. If you don't see a button that says raise hand, you'll see one that says more. And if you click on more, you'll see raise hand there. And then if you raise your hand, it'll light up Susan in a particular way and she will call on you and uh, like we can have a dialogue together. So that's what I really would like to spend the remainder of our time with. And I apologize for the technical challenges. So I really wanna hear from you. So raise your hand and then Susan, you call on people and we'll go. Well, and Frank, um, the folks that are calling in on a phone don't have that opportunity to raise their hand. So I'm just gonna give people a minute if you're on a phone to please, if you would like to participate, just unmute yourself and we'll organize that as best we can. And um, if there's anybody on a phone right now that would like to ask a question, please do that. Okay. Okay, Oops. and if not, we have Linda Schneider who has her hand up. Linda, could you unmute yourself, please? Linda, are you there? Yeah. Hi. Oh, hi, Linda. <laughs> How are you doing? You managing this technology okay? I'm having trouble. <laughs> well, it's it's um, up and down. <laughs> What's on your mind, Linda? What did you discover about... Uh, about the way in which you meet endings. That, that, um, that I have two feelings when I've had an intense encounter. One, one is this aloneness. It's sort of a postpartum experience. Um, it's not, it can be a loneliness, but it's usually not. It's more like um, an experience of being alone. I, ca I can't describe it. Okay. Um, You're doing yeah. fine. So, so when you meet, when you come to an ending, you, there's some feeling of loneliness. Is that, am I understanding you correctly? Sometimes it's loneliness if I haven't, fulfilled what I desired from the experience, which is probably my problem. And sometimes it's just a stark realization of my aloneness in okay. the world. Yeah. So, so the, lo the first is this feeling of like, I didn't quite get to do what I wanted to do. I don't feel complete somehow in what right. happened. And right. I'm left with some kind of residual holdover, something like that. Right, 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 okay. which, which is not, not quite Zen, right? I should. Well, go. let's not concern ourselves with that. Let's concern ourselves with your experience and not make it wrong, okay? <laughs> okay. Let's just see that what happens, right? So there's this feeling like I didn't quite do it, you know? That's, that's there, right? I mean, one of, the, one of the most disturbing things that I've witnessed over. 40 years of working with people who are dying is being at a bedside where people are filled with regret, actually, that they hadn't quite stepped into their lives yet. Yeah. Um, that's a really hard, it's a challenging thing to be with for, for them and, and even for me to be with them. Yeah. So it's a really, so why do you think that happens for you? Linda? Why do you think that happens? Um, something about, um, 
Uh, well, the current Marcy that I was talking to used the word connection junkie, uh, which, which I like a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm a bit of a connection junkie and it happens when I don't feel I've maybe filled myself enough from uh, the connection. <laughs> so you want something to happen in the connection that hasn't quite got happened there yet. And you right. want, want more, yeah. So can you see that the, so just to just be very brief here, Linda, can you see that what actually hurts is not that things end, but that there's this feeling of wanting more. Right, right. Not that, yeah, right. Not, not the one thing is bad, but realizing that the, you know, what actually causes the hurt or what causes the suffering, if you will, that's a big word, but what causes the discomfort uh -huh. is I want something more. I can't get it quite right. Like here's an example, okay? I like to lie in bed in the morning. I love to lie in bed under the blankets. Do you like that? Yeah. Yeah, me too. Okay. So I like it when there's big, you know, I have a big comforter on me and it's especially on cool winter mornings, you know, I just love being in bed and I just like, I just luxuriate, luxuriate in it for a while. And then you know what? I have to pee. <laughs> right. and so then I get up and I go to the bathroom, you know, and I hurry back into bed, you know, get under the covers again, try to get it just right. But I can't get it just right again can't make everything the way it was before yeah so the only choice i have is to meet the new experience right if i keep if i keep trying to make it as i wanted it to be i'm not going to enjoy it i can't be there for it yeah. so you really start to see that it's not the impermanence it's not the fact that things change that's the cause of the suffering but the way in which we cling to what we want to how we think it should be, yeah? So that's something you can watch. You can watch that in yourself and say, you know, life's hard enough. I don't need to cause myself a lot of extra suffering here. Yeah? Right, right. Good, Linda, that's really good. Good for you. All right, we're gonna, I wanna get to as many people as possible here. So I'm gonna let Susan choose, ask somebody else to join us, okay? Thanks, Linda. Thank you, Linda. Um, there's somebody who's uh, iPhone, I don't know, your name, but you're um, unmuted. Did you want to ask a question? That, that's probably going to be hard to identify themselves as someone with an iPhone. Is there somebody? They're the that's... only one that says iPhone next to them. So um, maybe I'm just going to mute them and then call Linda Holden. Could you please unmute yourself? Hi, Frank. Thank you. I saw oh, hi, you in hospice and you autographed my book. So I'm I giving did, you a quick I... plug. <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess my question about endings is yeah. I always kind of felt like a failure sometimes with endings. Mm -hmm. Like uh -huh. I didn't get the closure, I guess, that I needed to have the ending be an ending. Uh, my husband passed away this past February and I feel like two weeks before COVID, I feel like with this year and the books I've read, it's taught me to embrace all my feelings and he'd also been sick for a long time. So we had a lot of goodbyes, and a lot of closure and that's given me a lot of comfort. So I guess my question is more, how do I find, I'm hoping moving forward, I've learned how mm -hmm. to be better with endings. Yeah. But if I don't have the closure, I guess I expect. Okay. You know, you know what I'm asking kind of? <laughs> I think um, I do. I think I do. If I don't have the closure, how do I move forward from that ending, I guess? Is okay, my great. Good. That's a good question. Great. So, Linda, um, first of all, tell me your husband's name. Oh, his name was Bob. His name is Bob. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and, and just tell me something about Tell me something about him. Tell me what you miss about him. I miss his humor. I miss oh. that he was my person. And, he, you know, he'd been sick a long time, but he, he was, was your person. Friend. Yeah. He was my person. Yeah, yeah. So, Linda, I, I'm I'm a little suspicious of this term closure. <laughs> I don't like it so much because it kind of leads you to think that there's some way it all gets wrapped up and somehow a nice bow gets tied on the box and then it's all okay, you know. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure it is like that. I think we learn to live into our losses. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I feel like, like with the grief of my husband, 
it's never going to go away. I'm just going to learn to live with it differently. So I guess and I was talking to Sharon when we were in our thing, and I guess I did somewhat say the same thing with yeah. all those other things in my life. You just learn to live with them. But I guess I've always expected a better ending to things than right, right. And that's one of the that's one of the um, habits and one of the ideas that we have about endings is that they should wrap up in a particular way, right? So. So when you, when Bob, uh, after Bob died, you missed his humor. You, he was your person, right? He was your person. You counted on him in a way, right? Mm -hmm. So that isn't a single ending. And uh, you don't just lose Bob once. You know, when you get into bed at night and the sheets are cold, you miss him again. You know, you lose him again. And you know, if, if Bob was the one that did the banking business, I don't know how it was in your family, but when you go to the bank, you lose them again, right? So it's not a single event, this loss. It's a series of things, and it's a, it's a process of losing in a way, yeah? The first experience, this feeling of loss, is like someone punched you in the belly, right? You can't find your breath, you know, you, you don't know what to do. You know? You can't find, you know, you walk to the end of the end of your driveway and you don't know if you turn left or right. It's just kind of confusion there. Mm -hmm. you know? And then there's this long period of losing where, like what I was saying, that you keep losing this person because, you know, you're having to do something without them. I, like I, I work with a guy who was an executive of a very big company. I won't say which one. And he ate um, tuna fish out of a can for almost a year. Because he, it wasn't that he wasn't capable of going to a restaurant or some such thing, but his wife always made him dinner each evening. And he didn't know, it wasn't that he couldn't figure out how to cook. It's like he didn't know how to do it without her, in a way. So there's this long period of losing, losing. And it's not just something we learn to tolerate, Linda. It's, it's something we learn to include, in a way. And then there's this, there's this other period, if you will, and it's not so linear as this, and the, but with this, what I call it, I call it loosening, yeah, when the, the stranglehold of grief hasn't got you by the throat anymore, and things start to, you start to be able to reinvest in life, inc include yourself in life more, like, like there was a woman I worked with, Linda, and she, uh, she was married to her husband for 50 years, yeah, and he died, and, you know, it was really hard for her. And so every night she made a place for him at the dinner table. Mm -hmm. yeah. And every night she'd sit across from the dinner table and talk to him about her day and share with him about her day like they always had. Yeah. She said after about six months, she stopped making a place for him at the dinner table. Yeah. But she continued to talk to him all the time and ask for his advice on the decisions, how to, you know, when it was time to change the tires on the car, whatever it was. Yeah. And then she said there came to this point where that, that even that wasn't the case anymore, that when she asked for advice, she used to always hear it back in his voice. Mm. She said, but then it changed. And I said, how did it change? She said, oh, she said, I still take him. I go with him everywhere. He comes with me everywhere I go. But now I decide where we go on vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and, and basically, she started to hear her, her own wisdom coming back in her own voice. Yeah. So this, so think of this, think of this flow, loss, that punch in the belly, losing this long period that goes on for a long time, sometimes years. And then there's this period of loosening where the knot of grief starts to become untied and we can function in our life anymore. We don't, we're not leaving the person behind, we're bringing them with us in a way. And we have a kind of internal relationship with them that, um, that we go forward into the world with. How's that sound, Linda? It does. Uh, I mean, I. It makes great sense to me <laughs> up here, just not always right. Right. Yeah. So that's a real. That's a really good. That's beautiful, Linda. So that's the thing is to move that understanding from our head and nestle it deep in our hearts, right? So it it stays there as a kind of refuge for us. You know, it's not just a conceptual understanding; it's a heart wisdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, 
the way we get there is to not try and force ourselves to it or imagine that there's a particular way we should do endings, but to really um, ease our way into it, like you were easing your way into a bathtub of warm water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Linda. Thank you. And thank you for sharing Bob with us and bringing him into the room because, you know, he's here, you know. You know, he's always here. I don't mean it's a woo-woo California ghost-like way. I mean, he's here because he's in your heart. He's here with us. And thank you for including him. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Um, there's another Linda. Oh, there's more than one Linda. There's another Linda. Did yeah. you unmute yourself? There she is. Thank you. Hi. Can you hear me? I can. I can't see you very well, but I can hear you. Linda, okay. go ahead. There uh, we go. I, uh, from the, uh, the breathing, um, I noticed yeah. the bottom of the breathing, somehow it has come back up to, well, the sadness mm -hmm. has come back up into like the base of my throat and is lodged in there. Uh -huh. And um I know I have problems with self-expression. I don't, like once I start talking, but I don't. You're doing pretty good right now. World. Thank you. You know, I essentially have not lived my life because of um, holding back through concepts or whatever. The, um, yeah. the judging of the grief. My son uh, was a suicide. He died many years ago, about 15 or 16 years ago. Uh -huh. There were a number of situations that um, intercepted my grief. There were law enforcement people who mm -hmm. pushed into the room, and I had no chance to just be with my son and say goodbye to him personally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was interrupted, and then the day after the memorial, I was all set to do my grieving and I had to move out of my apartment because of a gas leak. And uh -huh. I, I've also just had a busy life, a stressful life where I've had to just keep doing what needed to be doing to survive, which so, is also what so I had to do. These interruptions in a way, right? Oh, lots of interruptions. Yeah, yeah. lots of interruptions. So, so right now, okay. Mm -hmm. No one's going to interrupt us. Okay, thank you. So tell me, tell me your son's name. Matt. Matt. Oh. And how old was Matt when he died? Um, he was like thirty-five or thirty-six, and uh, he was so a grown person, or adult. Yeah, adult, adult, adult yeah. mental illness. Uh, he had he had some challenges, mental challenges. Okay. He cool. had a lot of challenges. Oh, he did, huh? And he was very. Um, uh, intelligent and um, high functioning. So uh, I think it was very hard for him to understand why he couldn't, yeah. you know, function or succeed at normal levels. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Ah. Yeah. So one of the things that I know about my own sadness. Uh-huh is that when I try and figure it out too much, uh -huh. I get all tangled up. Yeah. I get tangled up in all my ideas about it and how it should have gone and why it didn't happen. And boy, I get it. I really can make a mess of myself. Yeah. Does that happen to you sometimes? Oh, in the past, I think it has. You oh. know, it's more about not being able to say goodbye to him, having, having yeah. authority come in and yeah the emotion you All know right. so linda let's try something right now you and me okay yeah. right, let's try it let's see if it works i want you to imagine okay i want you to use your imagination because that's a really good skill that we have i want you to imagine that matt is lying on a bed okay okay and that he's there and you're going to be able to bathe him okay <laughs> And that you didn't get to do this, right? You didn't get to touch it. I this. did not. Okay, good. So let's imagine now. Let's go to the top of Matt's head, okay? You put your hand right on his head. Okay. And you bless him like a mother blesses her child. Okay. 
you know, maybe it's words like, Matt, may your mind be clear so that no matter what you meet, you'll be open to it, okay? Just imagine being able to say that to him. No matter, may your mind be open and clear so that no matter what you meet, you can have clarity and you can be open to what you experience. Beautiful. Yeah. Now imagine for a second, just imagine putting your hands on his eyes. Okay. And you put like both your palms on his eyes. Okay. Yeah, you're beautiful. May your, may your eyes see clearly. May your eyes see clearly. May they be open to all manner of visions and possibilities on your journey. Yeah. Put, put your hands on his ears, Linda. Okay. Can you feel that? Can you feel his ears? Yeah. Okay, good. Wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, what would you say to his ears, Linda? You were blessing him. Um, just may you be open to hearing um, all the beauty and the blessings in the universe and beyond and open to hearing what's important for you and next you know what you need to know next uh, beautiful Linda that's a beautiful blessing and uh, know always that I love you always okay good all right one more let's let's put your hand on his heart now okay both your hands okay you got him resting there can you feel it can you see yeah it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Now, no fancy words, just heart to heart. What do you want to say to his heart? No fancy words. Just, I love you so much. I don't want you to leave. I'm sorry you needed to leave. I'm sorry for the pain you've had. And I want only blessings from you. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you. <laughs> you're being with him right now, Linda, in a way that you couldn't then, but you, you can now. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. And you, can, you can do this with him as a kind of practice, right? You can do this as a kind of practice and you can go through his whole body, through, through Matt's whole body, you know? Thank and your legs be strong to carry you on the journey, you know? Thank you, that's beautiful, thank you so much. Every part of his body, you go through every part of his body and visualize or imagine him. And really you speak from that part of your body to him. Yeah? <laughs> Because, you know, you carried him in your body. You carried him in your body. Yeah. Yeah. Linda? Yes. And that was a little boy when he was a newborn. Yeah. Remember when he was a newborn? Yeah. Flesh and that smell. Remember the smell of his forehead? Yeah, he was a yeah, and how soft it was there at the boy. top of his head. Can you yeah. remember that? Yeah. Uh, do you remember sometimes, I bet this happened for you, that you looked into his eyes. Maybe you were feeding him. Mm -hmm. And maybe you just had this feeling like you were one being. Did you ever have that experience? I had a feeling when I was holding him once, it was hot and we were pretty much skin to skin. Yeah just this deep, deep feeling of intimacy. Right, beautiful, beautiful. Mother and son intimacy, beautiful. Like one being, one, you know, and when Matt was a little infant, he didn't know you were different. He didn't know you were him. <laughs> he thought you were him. <laughs> you and him were one thing, yeah? He liked me. <laughs> yeah, he loved you, I'm sure. <laughs> so, but he just had this experience of you being one being. One being. And then, you know, we grow and we differentiate and we individualize and all that. And we become our, we get lost in the idea of being a separate self. Mm -hmm. But actually, 
you know, we see truly in those early years, we see truly. That's true now. That intimacy that you knew with him as an infant is true now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 You. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. So you practice that, okay? You try that practice. I will. <laughs> All right, good, good. All right. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Frank. You're welcome. Oh, hi, Susan. I, I, I don't, you know, I don't track time. So maybe we have time for one more. I don't know. Okay, we have two hands up. We have, we can have time for one more. And Linda, I just want to encourage you to take a look at the chat because people have sent you some really beautiful messages. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, Neil, could you unmute yourself, please? Neil. Okay. Hi, Susan. Hey, Neil. Hi, Frank. Um, Linda, we're thinking about you and um, you were very brave in what you just did. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very sacred work you did with Frank just now. So sending you a lot of light and peace and continued grieving in the way you need to, okay? Well, Frank, um, I don't know why I'm going here, but there's one thing you said in your book that I read a couple of years ago when it first came out mm -hmm. that I, I keep going back to. And that is, um, and I just want to say it here because I feel it in all the things we've done in the last hour, listening to Linda and you and all the exercises. And that is, you talked about it in very articulate ways about we can't make the end safe for people. We can't make them feel safe. I think you said it this way, mm -hmm. because dying doesn't feel safe for some people, it, for many, for all. And I, I may be not saying it in the way you wrote it, Frank, but that has been, um, I'm doing grief and loss support work and that just that one line has yeah. um, been, compelling in so many ways. So I just want to thank you for that. Okay. Well, so Neil, what I think, I don't remember what I said because I wrote it. Right. <laughs> but I, you know, what I know about the experience is that lots of times we imagine that our work in being caregivers is to make other people feel safe. And that's really good if you can do it, but you can't always do it. You know, you know, it's like, we want to take away everybody's pain. Well, if that was the only job in dying, it would be easy. We would just snow people with morphine. That isn't, our, that isn't the only work. So if we imagine that our only work is to keep people safe, we're always leaning into that experience. But what I find to be useful, Neil, and I bet you can do it, is that when I'm really, when I've done my homework and I'm really residing in my compassionate heart, you know, a wise, compassionate heart, then what I notice is that the people that I'm with, they recognize that and they trust it. And because they trust it, they know they're not in their suffering by themselves, right? They know that they're accompanied there. And then they're willing to go to some of the most scary places, places they were never willing to go to before, not because it's safe, but because they won't be left alone because they're accompanied by someone who isn't adding more fear to their fear, yeah? So you can do that, Neil. You can be a trustworthy refuge, but in order to be a trustworthy refuge, you gotta do your homework. You gotta know what your own relationship is to sickness, to illness, to, to aging and death. You know, you can't just have ideas about it. You gotta know it deep in your bones. Yeah. And then you can build an empathetic bridge from your experience to theirs. You can, um, you can be a compassionate companion. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's more useful and more important than trying to make someone feel safe. You know, when I was in the hospital, I had some strokes recently and um, four or five of them, I forget now. But 
when I was in bed, when someone opened the door to my hospital room, I could almost smell whether or not they were trustworthy for me. You know? And how they came in the room and how they how they interacted with me. I mean, some people, some of the nurses I, that I worked with, they were great people, but they had more of a relationship with the device they brought in the room than they did with me. Yeah. But the people who were willing to come into the room and sit down and say, how are you doing today? Wow. They were, they were good companions. They were compassionate companions on the journey. Yeah. So do your homework. That's what enables you to become a trustworthy refuge for other people. Yeah. Then it's not a matter of trying to get all the conditions right so they feel safe and they don't have any fear. It's that you can be with their fear. And that's the real work of compassion. The work of compassion isn't just about taking away someone's suffering. Compassion gives us the capacity to stay with someone's suffering. And what happens by staying with it is all our defenses against the suffering, they fall down like the walls of Jericho. And then the true causes of the suffering can be seen instead of just the defenses. And then we can intervene. So then we can do something. Then compassion can be an action, a skillful action to help sometimes relieve or reduce that suffering. So compassion is what allows us to stay in the room when the going gets rough. It keeps us from running down the hall. Yeah. You have that in you, Neil. You can do that. Each of us has the capacity to embrace someone else's suffering as our own. Every one of us can do that. But you got to do your homework. Okay. All right, Neil. Thank Thanks you. very much. It's a really good to talk with you. You too. Okay. Oh, Susan, I don't know where we are in time. Unfortunately, my due to my strokes, I can't track time. So I, I right. So we're we're about six minutes over, Frank. We do have one last question, and if this is. If it's sure. too much, then no, no, no. It's we fine. just have one person. Okay, Jenny, do you want to unmute yourself? Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, it isn't actually a question, but I want I you um, pretty much touched on it when you were talking with Linda about her and Bob and continuing. You know that it's a process, but in the conversation that we had in our breakout group, I. I realized something I didn't know before, and that was that I think I experience endings as part of the experience rather than an event separate. And um, I was thinking back when um, I had my first child, mm -hmm. my father suddenly died about three weeks before my first child was born. Oh. And he was very young, he was like 57, you know, so. Um, it was a big shock, but as the time went on, as I was taking care of my baby, I realized in a way that I was walking with grief and joy at the same time mm -hmm. and how um, it was all part of my relationship with my father and with my son. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that has a lot to do with how I look at endings. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, you know, this word impermanence, which is, you know, big in the Buddhist, you know, cosmology, but not so familiar always to everyone else. It doesn't, it doesn't just talk about the way things finish, you know, it's, it's called the law of change and becoming. And, and what it really is referencing is that things don't just end and fall off the end of the earth, you know, they become, every ending gives rise to a becoming. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's so graphic in the story that you're telling about your father's death and your child's birth, right? Yeah. That everything is continually changing and becoming, changing and becoming, right? That's the cycle of things, yeah. Just mm -hmm. uh, yesterday, I was with a man, a very famous farmer, and, um, and he's dying. And we were talking about his dying, and he said, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> he's a wonderful guy. And, a fantastic farmer, actually, a brilliant farmer. I said, I said, well, what do you know about the earth? He said, oh, the earth, I know. I said, oh, yeah, huh? tell me about it. And he said, oh, he said, the earth, he said, he said, you got to not mess with the earth too much. I said, oh, really, on the farm? He said, yeah, you got to trust the earth. I said, why? And he said, oh, because the earth has its cycles, you know. 
it's always it's always renewing itself in a way you know it's always renewing itself and i said oh okay i said what do you do when a storm comes to the farm and he said oh he said i we have ways of preparing and we prepare the farm and we take care of the farm and i said what happens if the storm doesn't come and he said oh you know it's okay then at least we were really well prepared i said right i said i think you know everything you need to know about the dying process yeah you know about the cycles of things. You know about to, how to prepare yourself. And then if something doesn't happen quite the way you imagine, it's okay, you're prepared, yeah. So, yeah, it's in the cycle of things. And, and it's so, you know, your, your experience is such a teaching for us about that, that these things are mixed up in each other, our joy and our sorrow, right? They're not in separate little boxes. You know, we don't have the joy box and the sadness box, right? They, they intermingle. And in, in my tradition, we talk about the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows yeah? that, are, that characterize this life and that are always interacting with each other. We don't just end. We are becoming, continuously becoming. Yeah? And, and you are that too. You are reconstituted by your dad's death and by your child's birth. You're not the same. You're reconstituted by that experience. I can imagine you, you can appreciate the myriad of ways that you feel yourself is different. Yeah. yeah beautiful. Yeah. Yesterday I was talking to a uh, interviewer about Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, you know, old, one of my old teachers and friends and and, uh, you know, she had an expression, I don't remember it, I'm paraphrasing it, but she said, if not for the winds and the storms, we would never have the beauty of the canyons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So both let the joy and the sorrow cut its way into your heart. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a mistake that those are there. They enable you to not only be reconstituted, but they become... That, that those things that allow you to be available to others and their suffering too. You know, the old expression that Jung talked about, the wounded healer, right? He said mm -hmm. that in every physician there is a patient and in every patient there is a physician that can contribute to the healing. When we go into our wounds, when we know something about them, it gives us a resonance for other people's wounds of, or, that are similar to our own, yeah? And when we've investigated, when we've, when we've looked and, and done our work, our healing work with those wounds, then we can be a wounding healer. Then we can be a trustworthy refuge for others. When we haven't done that, we become wounding healers. Mm -hmm. We hurt people through our, our unresolved pain. Yeah. So this is your work to include, include it in your life you know, so that it becomes your asset. It becomes something that enables you to reach out to others tenderly, kindly, compassionately. Yeah. Beautiful, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing your dad here and your child here as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. You're most welcome. So I know we have to end, Susan. So I, I just want to say thank you to you and to Mission Hospice for inviting me. And I, I, I apologize for the technical screw-ups. Um, but I, I hope there's been something I've said or you, that is of some small service to you. I, I don't know. But, uh, you know, what I really want to say at the end of this is really trust your essential heart to be a reliable guide. It's not going to steal you wrong. You know, my friend Ram Das, who a dear old friend who died this last year, he, he used to say that it's a very short journey from here to here, from your head to your heart, you know? But it can take a whole lifetime or it can happen in a moment. Trust your heart to be a reliable guide. It won't let you down, okay? Thank you very, very much. I, I hope it's been of some small support to you. <laughs>